we had already done a bunch of testing. I think some of that kicked off some of the work that Jeff was doing. And because um, we, we did a similar survey and looked at um, being, an, being someone that sells these materials, we have access to everybody, what they're doing from a design methodology. So we looked at all of those things, kind of, I'm gonna show you a lot of data and a lot of math. And if I wanted to leave the, if everybody wants to leave, I'll show a bunch of chemistry, but I don't think anybody wants to see that. Um, so um, I think people are familiar with this process at this point, but basically this is lining a culvert. So that one on the, the before was, um, I think that was an Indiana, an Indiana DOT project. A lot of these things were already bituminously coated. You can coat right over that, um, spray those systems, and then you end up with a coated pipe. Um, the system that we've tested is a geopolymer, so I think um, there were some presentations earlier, but I'd like to give a quick primer for people that have never heard that word. So my first, and this is all the chemistry I have, and I promise there's not even a molecule on here, so you're good. Um, the first thing I like to say is, just because it says the word polymer does not mean it's a plastic. So um, these are long chain bonds of inorganic materials, but they are definitely not flexible. It, it looks and feels like a cement. You put things that look like cement with water together, and they form a reaction, and they end up having more like the chemistry of granite or quartz. So those things are long chain molecules that are not plastic. So when you see the word polymer, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a plastic. So these are inorganic systems. Um, these are typical properties of them. This is for the material that we use, but um, in general, most everyone in the marketplace that's providing something that's of cementitious is gonna have very similar properties. From our view, the key value, um, I think you saw some of the, the testing that they did in the third talk in this area. The failure modes of these things are not gonna be buckling or but they are gonna be flexure where that's gonna be the weak point of the cracking system. So the flexural modulus is, is key, the flexural strength is key, and those are important properties to take a look at. So if nobody's ever seen this done, um, there are a whole bunch of different systems that people use, but generally they are pulling some sort of sled with some sort of spin head, um, different from normal shockcrete applied concrete, the spin head can either be air rotated or mechanical, but you are not putting air into the mortar. You are basically flinging it. So high speed rotation is what's creating the force to throw the material out. So it's not an air driven process typically, unless someone's applying it by hand. So you get really good compaction um, and some other things and it's pulling it back. Um, um, like Dr. Jaffe said, there's a whole bunch of ways people do this. Some of them are doing them with wenches, some are doing it with chains. Um, my personal view is some of them are controlled and some of them aren't controlled. And so you should be looking for people that are doing it in some sort of controlled manner that they can give you some sort of information as to how they decided what rate to pull it back at. Um, I don't know how, but maybe let me see if I can kill the sound on that. But this is an actual job on um, State Road 446 in October of 2015 in Indiana. So um, you can see, if you've never seen this, is real. So the, the portion that looks a little more brown has had a single pass applied to it. And everywhere else, it hasn't yet applied. They're applying about a half an inch on this pass. I think this pipe was like 350 feet long. Um, and they ended up putting an inch and a half on it. it I looked, it's been in the ground three years. It looks a lot better than some of those pictures I've seen because I walked through it last December. Um, but this is them applying it. They have a, a spin head that's moving back and forth, but it's being, it, I mean, it's really slow. You can't really see they're probably, it's moving through the pipe at probably like at most 12 inches a minute. So, you know, they're talking about an eight hour process to do a half inch on that pipe, something like that. Um, these are, are kind of still pictures of that. That's one from the front. Um, I think both of these are actually 
in a 54 inch pipe in, in Cary, North Carolina. The front picture is kind of like an easy one to see where they started and the back picture is kind of what it looks like, um, what they're pulling through the whole system. Um, so that's kind of what how the systems are done. So um, we did some work in conjunction with Louisiana Tech, which has a, a trenchless technology center there um, to try to come up with some design methodologies and design work. Most of the math was done in conjunction with myself and um, a resolution who's now at Stantec in, um, in Edmonton, Calgary. So we looked at a variety of pipe sizes. So we looked at corrugated metal, reinforced cardboard, or reinforced, we did some cardboard, we did some corrugated metal, we did some reinforced concrete. Um, we took corrugated metal pipes and deflected them and applied the same thickness to those materials at different deflections, anywhere from 2.4 to 12%. Um, we used pipe diameters from 24 inch to 48 inch. And anything that was reinforced concrete was pre-broken. So we, we failed it to a deload um, plus 20% deflection on top of that. We did not take it to full failure because it's really hard to repair something that's in four pieces. Um, so for a guy that spends all their time in a chemistry lab, everyone is really jealous when you get to rent a crane. And um, in, the, in the rest of the civil engineering world, you all use cranes all every day. For us that you know, work on five grams of material and people get PhDs that way, running a crane was very exciting. So we cut the bells off of all these pipes so they didn't have any um, influence. And then we cut them all in half, so we used four-foot segments of pipe. Um, we did deload testing, which is, according to ASTM, um, C497 there. So if you're not familiar with deload testing of concrete pipe, basically you put it in a load frame, you put a block of wood on the bottom that are spaced about two or three inches apart and you load it from the top. And that's a very severe load. That's not really what you're gonna see in any real world case. So then you adjust for that load on top of that. Um, we don't have this nice outdoor one, so we don't have one we can bury a bunch of stuff, but I do have a gigantic load frame that'll do 250, 300,000 pounds inside. So you can see that's the load frame. Um, we can actually raise and lower that um, head on it severely, and then we can also build up from the bottom, so it, depending on what's more practical. And that's the inside of one of these reinforced concrete pipes before they were broken, or they were broken and then they were repaired. Um, so. It's a picture of me actually working. People sometimes say that it doesn't happen. But we did all of these pipes. We repaired them a little bit more like a manhole just because they're so short that it's too difficult to set up material and, and pull it all the way through. So we turned them up on end and repaired them. So you can see that's the pipe going in. You can see all the pieces there. So we prepared about 55 pipe samples. Um, and you can see, let's see if this works. For example, Nope, that went forward. It says it has a fancy laser, but I don't, it's definitely not working. Um, some of these pipes, they're all numbered, but you can see some of these are starting to get very narrow. So we deflected some of these 24 inch pipes up to 12% before we repaired them to try to get a feel for what effect deflection would have on the load carrying capacity of those things. Um, so anybody that's never put any of these things in a load frame, I thought I'd give you a little understanding. The, the black line at the bottom is a standard corrugated metal pipe, not bedded at all, put in a load frame. It doesn't have all that much strength. It gets a lot of its strength from the soil. It's, you know, it's a very flexible pipe system. When you put a cement mortar lining in it or a geopolymer lining it, you can see the blue line is that pipe that's been lined. Um, the failure mode would be in that 5,000 pound range where you see an initial crack. Um, and that's, you get a load drop. And then what you'll see in these cement systems is even once they crack, they don't necessarily fail right away. They have a significant, they take a significant amount of load on top of that. So we actually didn't fail any, we only failed one pipe to ultimate load and we crushed about $6,000 worth of electronics, so we stopped that. Um, 
And, um, and so we had um, some other tests there, but you can see basically you, you could get without much trouble 10 times the original strength of the system, but then it's not obviously carrying the buried load. Um, so I assume everyone in here is hydraulic engineer, so they don't care too much about structure. Um, as a chemical engineer, I had to teach myself all of this stuff. So what we did was we basically just looked at the moment, the cracking moment at the crown of the pipe, because when you see these things, they will all fail within a couple percent of the crown of the pipe when they do it. Um, and there's a variety of equations that are going to come after this, but what I would say is the only thing that we have done from different than standard mechanics is typically if you have a pipe thickness, people are going to look at the lever arm associated from the neutral axis of the pipe, which is this T over 2. And so when you start to look at what happens, um, I think Dr. Jaffe talked about bonding of the pipe. The cementitious systems are not going to bond that great to a corrugated metal pipe, and they're going to bond somewhat to a concrete pipe, but they are going to have some interaction. And so when you look where that one half ends up, it ends up to be more conservative to get rid of that two because it ends up in the wrong side of the equation. So you give yourself a longer lever arm, assuming that the neutral axis is at the interface between the pipe and whatever lining system you put in. That's the most conservative assumption you can make um, that's practical. And so we, we make that assumption and adjust for that. So that's the only thing that we would do different from a standard mechanical analysis. Um, so I've been in, install, helping people install these systems for about seven years, and I've looked at every model anybody has ever stamped a drawing on. Um, I don't think anybody's ever stamped a drawing on an F1216 model for, um, if you're not familiar with it, that's the cured in place standard that he was talking about because that's a flexible pipe standard and these are definitely rigid. So the first that some people were early on pushing was let's just assume a uniform radial pressure outside of that pipe so you can look up the equations for that in stress and strain books, and basically you'll generate something that looks like that model where the thickness is proportional to the two and a half root, but in general that you're going to see basically it's proportional to the load and some sort of version of the radius and some physical property. So this is one that they've done for elastic modulus. Um, Ed Campbell, who's working on the other project, has proposed a couple other models. Um, out of structured buried mechanics, there's some work around coating of exterior steel pipelines with concrete and trying to figure out when those crack. So there's a cracking model. There's been several projects that have been proposed this way. The difference is what do you pick for cracking? So a typical concrete pipe repair, you would pick a 0.01 inch. Um, some people have argued that you can pick up to a sixteenth of an inch, the .0625, in a stormwater situation because you don't really care too much about some of the leaking. Um, but I'll show you what that does. Um, this is the model we, we have ended up recommending, but it's basically assuming you have a, an arch that's fixed, which you end up with a very decent model in this case, and you're loading it with a a distributed beam load across the top. You end up with that equation at the bottom. And the, the fourth thing that we looked at is there are some papers from Northwestern University at Chicago from the early 80s doing some scaling theory where they broke some pipes, some small pipes, by crushing them straight forward and then breaking them longitudinally and trying to calculate what was the, the stress of this. And those were unreinforced concrete pipes. So we took all of that data and applied that as well. It's probably the second best approximation. So um, you don't need to know all of this, but we measured all the physical properties. A third party lab came and did this, and the university did all this and took samples of everything that was being done at that day. Um, when we made all these samples over about a three day period, we then tested, let everything cure, tested them 28 days later. So you have to let these materials cure because they don't build their full strength until at least 28 days. Um, and then we made some estimations for reinforced concrete pipes 
we assumed a bedding factor of one and a half. For corrugated metal pipes, we assumed a bedding factor of two and a half. And when you, you also find no one in their right mind really deload tests corrugated metal pipe because you're not actually uniformly loading it because you're loading only the corrugations. So we made some geometry adjustments for that to get the right loadings and scaling because you really were just loading portions of the pipe. So without further ado, I will click through a few data slides and I will try to keep this in time as much as possible. So the black line was that uniform radial pressure line and all the blue points are real data points scaled with the bedding factor um, for these pipes. And you'll see in every case that's the least conservative line and it doesn't predict what you see in the brake tests. The, the yellow line and the red line are the cracking model that they had proposed. And if you use a 0.01 approximation for cracking, it actually way overestimates the actual design that load you would need. If you use a 0.0625 cracking load, it almost always under predicts it. And the other two vary a little bit in the middle. And you'll see these are for 48 inch RCP pipes. These are 24 inch RCP pipes. These are 36 inch CMP pipes. You can see the data is reasonably approximated by the middle lines. These are, you know, there's a lot of error and scatter in, in doing this kind of large scale testing. Here's 48 inch CMP pipes. And then this is the data for func different ovalities, all with the same thickness, all with the same pipe size from zero to 12% ovality. What you'll notice is it really didn't vary all that much with, with that structure. Um, in fact, some of the ones that are of the highest ovality are in the middle. Some of the ones that are the lowest ovality are near the bottom. But basically the cracking load ended up being fairly similar so in flexible pipe, the ovality is much more important than it is going to be in a rigid pipe structure. Um, the other important thing to look at is, so this is an assumption of the design pressures that you would have versus various pipe depths. So you'll see almost in all cases, your design pressures are going to be for only most reasonably buried culverts less than 25 feet, assuming the groundwater is at the surface, which is even a worst case scenario the design pressures are typically under 25 PSI on the crown of the pipe. So why that's important is what you might come back and look way down here. It becomes important because your design pressures are actually way down here. And it turns out that that green line becomes way more conservative, way faster than that blue line. That's the only important point to note. So we have done a variety of modeling. This is, this is what you would get with thicknesses with the model that we would typically recommend. Um, and with that, I will um, conclude. So we did something on the order of 35 pieces of pipe. We did some control pipes, some other things. We tested five models to them. There are some that are very conservative. There are some that are very predictive. And um, if anybody has any interest in this, um, I guess you can download the presentations. But the references, all of that work is published at from NASTD's no dig, all the data points, all the information, all the analysis is available. And I'd be happy to email it to anybody else if they want it. So with that, I will conclude. And if anybody else has questions, I'm happy to answer if Jeff says there's time. Okay, any questions for Joe? I think there's need for consensus, because I think I think there are a lot of people under designing stuff. Um, I just would be careful that I don't think you can use flexible models to, to, to model these rigid pipes. There's a hand over here. So with the kind of the arch free body diagram, that's because um, do you assume that there's a plastic hinge at the, at the crown line? Because it seems like it's a plastic failure due to flexure. Yeah, it's it ends up being. I mean, you're basically analyzing the moment at that point. Yep. And in the f when it fails, it becomes a hinge, okay. but, but not beforehand. Okay. So we're, we're looking to what's the point that you generate the crack. Right. And that's okay. what the load failures are. So really what you're looking at is it's calculating the tension mm -hmm. on the inside, of the sur inside surface of that thing, which is actually a flexing okay. 
strength because moment. Because when we design bridges and we're doing a composite beam, um, we assume a plastic section. What happens is that you you're forcing the beam to break at permanent deflection. Yep. And that's what's going on here. And I'm wondering if the underestimations come because it's more of an elastic failure. Not this part, but it looks like more of a plastic failure rather than elastic. Yeah, I think that the under, like, so the ASTM committee for this, I don't think there's anybody in here that's on that committee other than me. It's a disaster. But okay. nobody can agree on anything. And all the standards that got through got through about 25 years ago before um, anybody was doing anything. So there have been a lot of arguments around this stuff. So I, I think the reality of the underprediction is, one, I think a uniform radial load is it's a good prediction for a manhole, but it's not a good prediction for the loading capacity of what's going on there. So it's very, it's, it's taking advantage of a lot of compression modeling. Um, and we have had a couple projects that required um, computer modeling for the design where it was just required. And it, it comes pretty close to the data that we have. I mean, within five or eight percent, which is really good. Okay, if you have any other question for Joe, I'm sure you could buy him a beer after this and he'll talk problem. freely. So let's round of applause.